And so what we do is we serve alongside of our dom denominations partners in Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon, and hopefully that will be expanding to Iran. Now, um, you, you heard a lot on the news this past summer about the city of Mosul, which is sort of kind of the headquarters of, in the Nineveh Plain as the Islamic State took over and declared an Islamic State and city of Mosul is one of the central cities in that area. Well, the earliest Protestant church in the Middle East was founded in the city of Mosul in 1840 through the labors of Presbyterian and other reformed missionaries. And we, we actually are good friends with the final family that stood fast in that church until they, they, were, they were forced to leave. And now we do not know if the church is even standing anymore. But the hearts of the church still go on. Well, and even further than that, the presence of today's Eastern Church in the Middle East goes back to the first century. So there Sometimes people ask, well, are there Christians in the Middle East? There is a huge legacy of, of Christian brothers and sisters that's even recognized and beloved by, by many moderate Muslims, even. A, a deep relationship that goes, goes back for, for generations. Now, our call on behalf of the PCUSA really is to strengthen the arm of those partners that, that are there. And uh, your pastor mentioned that we have a large territory. Well, we have a lot of partners, and they do the heavy lifting. Really, our job is to encourage them, love them, support them, and, and build partnerships with the brothers and sisters here in the States. And, and it really is our, is our joy to send greetings from, from them as well, because they really are our brothers and sisters. We have a shared baptism. And when, when they say that they are praying for you, they mean it. And when I go back and I tell them that, that the Presbyterian Church in Encino loves them and has heard their story and is praying for them, that, that truly touches their hearts and encourages them. Because it's a relationship culture. Relationships are everything. So when they know that that you care about them, that, that does something in here for them. And so, so we partner with them through prayer and visits. Um, we advocate for them in many ways. We, we do lots of financial partnership. And, and we're going to share a little bit about that today. But, but first, I want to read a, a third scripture. And that's from Revelation 22. And these are the words of Jesus. Look. I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. And here's, here's the clincher. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. And we'll talk about that. Let's pray. Holy Spirit of Jesus, bright morning star, there are, there are times right now for, for your, your children in other parts of the world and your children right here where we're feeling discouraged. And Lord, we thank you that you give us a name that we can call, that you give us hope. And so, Lord, speak to us through your word that we would understand who you are in the middle of our discouragement, that we would continue to trust you and give you glory. Amen. How long, Lord, how long? Those were the scriptural cries that you just heard in our first two passages. And, and this is a biblical language that God has given to us in Scripture that throughout ancient times, God's people have cried out to God in this way when they have faced darkness and evil 
and things like exile and genocide. And, you know, for a long time, I've, I've read those words in Scripture, and to be honest, I've understood them, but I don't know if I fully got them. They, they've always felt like, well, they're still outside of my experience a little bit. Well, a year ago, these words took on a new relevance for me. I, I have a Syrian friend named Salam, and he, he's from the city of Aleppo, and about a year and a half ago, that city was just devastated with, with fighting. And extremists bombed and gutted the city of Homs. Or, yeah, Homs is where he grew up. I'm sorry, not Aleppo. Homs. And so these words that, I, that, that Pastor just read um, from the Psalms and Lamentations, he posted those words on Facebook. These were the cries of his heart for something that was happening right now around us. And so these words from scripture take on new relevance. And in the same way, un until a few years ago, these things I saw on the news, really they, they felt kind of distant to me. I, I saw them and understood on the news and I cared about it, but it wasn't really until I got to meet these people and see their faces that I began to understand. And partly hope, I hope today is that as we share stories, you will start to get to know some of these people as well. One of these people that um, we've met is um, Mayada, who is an Iraqi Presbyterian, and she lives with her husband, Reverend Haitham, in Kirkuk, Iraq. And, they, and that is in the proximity of Mosul. And together they serve in the Presbyterian church there. Well. When Elmarie was with her last year, she, Mayada was being asked some questions, and, and there she is. She's the one who circled to the left, and the man to the, in the center that circled, that's Reverend Hytham, and I'll be talking about them a lot. Um, they're phenomenal people. Well, Mayada was asked some questions by a Lebanese wo Christian woman, and she said, with everything now happening in Iraq, don't you think the church will need to leave? And this is how Mayada replied. I'm just going to read this quote here. Of course, it is a discouraging time. But we know from Scripture that Jesus told his first disciples that they could expect times of great difficulty. This word is also true for us today. Jesus didn't try to hide the truth from his followers. In fact, he prepared us for these kinds of times. We believe the church belongs to him and he will not abandon his church. He will continue to give us daily strength. He has called us to serve in his name during such a time as this. We cannot leave. Our heart conviction will not allow us to leave. And this morning, and especially in our fellowship time, I'll share some of the stories of what they're doing as they stay in that very hard place. Well, in October, we visited with another pastor in Iraq. His name is Farouk, and he serves in the Presbyterian Church in Baghdad. He's the one on the right. Um, and, and I'm also going to just share a quote of what he said about his time in, in Baghdad. And, and we're actually going to be able to go to Baghdad this spring, we are hoping. And this is what Farouk says. It is a dark time for Christians right now, but we are also seeing how Jesus continues to be at work. Many Christians are being renewed in their faith and have received a deep conviction of the need to stay in Iraq and continue the work of serving in Christ's name. And many Muslims are also coming to the church for spiritual encouragement. Every week, we have new people in our worship service, our prayer gatherings, and our Bible studies. And get this, Jesus is not yet finished with his church in Iraq or in the Middle East. Isn't that amazing? That's probably not what you expected to hear this morning. It's not what I expected to hear um, three years ago. Well, it is a dark time for Christians and, and other, other minorities in many places throughout the Middle East. It's, it's not simply Christians who are being persecuted. It's also Yazidis um, and even minority Muslims 
and even majority Muslims who have taken a stand against the violence. They are also in danger. So how long can the church endure? How long can these families, and as you can see, they don't look much different from us, how, how can they endure all of these, these things that are going on and being carried out in the name of religion? Well, these are questions that nobody knows the answer this side of heaven, and yet today we're going to be talking about what Elmarie and I have been learning from our brothers and sisters in the Middle East, and I'll tell you, we're being encouraged and strengthened in our faith through their stories. And we're going to be talking about what it means to live with the hope of Christ when all seems lost. Now, in the book of Revelation, the passage we just read, G Jesus is giving a message to the church in the first century because they're facing terrible times also. And the darkness that they're experiencing, the, the scripture describes it with a word called flipsis, flipsis, and it means crushing pressure. That's what they're feeling in the first century, and, and they're so discouraged. And Jesus gives them a word of hope to, to keep going, and, and the word that he gives them is a name, and it's a name for him that, that they can call upon. And the name he gives is, I am the bright morning star. Now, the bright morning star, what does that mean? Well, the Presbyterian scholar, Daryl Johnson, and he's got a great book on Revelation, by the way, he, he, this is how he describes it. The morning star appears when the night has reached its greatest degree of darkness. Indeed, the morning star only appears when the night is the darkest. Although it's still dark, and even though there's going to be about three or four hours until daybreak, when you see the morning star, you know that the night is over. And because Jesus, the morning star, because he is near, even though it's still dark, it will never again be totally dark. We're learning through our brothers and sisters in the Middle East what this name means to them and how it's impacting them. And it's a word of hope, not just for the ancient church, but for the church today. And this, this name of Jesus is, is giving them courage to, to stand even when it seems like the darkness is never going to go away. Because you know, fear and chaos and destruction, th those are the tools that extremists use. That's what they use. Now, one of our partners named Fatty Dagger, he's the General Secretary for the National Evangelical Synod of Syria and Lebanon, and essentially they're, they're Presbyterians. Um, um, he was testifying um, back in October to, um, to a, a, a UN group, and, and I want to just share what he said. Um, he, he stands up and he says, we Christians must defend ourselves against extremism. And a whole bunch of hands go up. Because they're thinking that he's talking about guns and forming militias. And he says, no, 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 you misunderstand me. He says, no, as Christians, we defend ourselves when we resist the powers of fear, chaos, and destruction. We resist by staying in the ancient homelands and continuing to minister to all who have need, all who have need, in Christ's name. We defend ourselves by continuing to build schools to educate Muslims and Christians together and teaching the values that allow us to peacefully coexist. And on a quick side note, these schools that they build, and they've been around for generations, um, Christians and Muslims study together. And typically, when you hear of a prominent, moderate Muslim who is working for peace, chances are that Muslim was taught in one of these Christian schools. So th these schools are agents of peace. 
let's continue with what that Thaddee says. He says, we resist fear and defend ourselves against extremism by holding to the way of life that Jesus teaches us. And these aren't just words to Reverend Fatty or the rest of the pastors in Syria and Lebanon. They work tirelessly with partners from Europe and the U.S. For nearly four years, they've been doing this to make sure that the 15 remaining Presbyterian congregations in Syria are able to stand. And so they are bringing all of the items that they need to survive, food, clothing, fuel, medications, hygiene items. They bring these to the communities when, when, they, when, it's, when they're not able to bring trucks of supplies in because often those trucks get hijacked by, by extremists. They, they, they bring in vouchers so that they can buy those things. They, they've assisted over 3,000 Muslim and Christian families throughout Syria. And they do that on a regular, monthly basis. The, this current academic year, the church in both Aleppo and Homs, which have been just devastated, both of those places, the church has reopened their schools with several hundred students attending, both Christian and Muslim. The Synod is working with the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance to raise funds for over 40 families to rebuild their homes in the city of Homs in central Syria. Because it's so important to the church that Christians are able to remain in that area. Because that's, the Christian presence makes a difference. The eight remaining Presbyterian pastors in Syria, they, they continue to meet with individuals and families. They, they offer encouragement and spiritual care. The north, in the northwestern city of Aleppo, even though the Presbyterian church building has been destroyed by rocket fire, the congregation has made the commitment to stay in Aleppo, and so they crowd into a small apartment every week. Every week, they, they worship and they serve others. In, in Aleppo, the water infrastructure has also been destroyed. And this is a city, it was a city of four million. And so what the churches have done, and not just the Presbyterians, um, the, the Orthodox, um, the Chaldean Catholic, um, you know, when, when, you, when you get to this kind of stuff, the lines between church denominations start to blur because you're all, you're all in the same boat. And, and what these churches have done is they have drilled wells on their property to provide water for the community. The, there's an Armenian pastor in Aleppo named Reverend Yosef, and he said that the lines at his church begin for, forming at 4 in the morning every day, um, and they don't finish until after 10 at night because there's such a need for water. Well, this pump... In, in, in their property relies on a generator. And fuel is very, very expensive, and it's very, very hard to come by. And there's a petrol station, that's what we call it there, petrol. Um, the petrol station um, is, is behind the church, and it's owned by a Muslim man. And he has always kept his distance from the church. Well, one day, Reverend Yosef gets up, you know, 3 a.m. to go out to the generator, and he has no idea how he's going to find or buy fuel for that coming day. And to his great surprise, he opens up the, the, the fuel tank and sees that it's full. And he learns later on that the Muslim pet petrol station owner filled it. And, and so Yosef goes, goes to the man to pay for the fuel, but the Muslim man stops him. He says, you have given water for free to anyone who has need, both Christian and Muslim. You have loved the whole community. This fuel is my thank you. This is how the Christian community is defending themselves. This is the way of Jesus. This is what they're doing in the face of extremism. Um, in, in June, over a million people lost their homes and their livelihoods to the advance of ISIS in Iraq, in, in the Nineveh Plain. And the surrounding cities of Dahuk, Erbil, and Somania, and Kirkuk, 
they, they, ha they are filled to overflowing with displaced families literally overnight. And ma many of these families, um, Christian, Muslim, and Yazid Yazidi, um, th th they've turned to the churches for help. And Reverend Hytham in Mayada, in Kirkuk, and you saw their pictures a little bit ago, um, all hours of the night, they receive knocks on the door. Now, in Kirkuk, and, and we were there in October, um, Kirkuk is not under ISIS control, but there are sleeper cells everywhere. And Hytham and Mayada, they never know who's going to be on the other side of the door. They kiss each other goodbye each morning, no, never knowing who's going to be on the other side of the door. And how, 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 do you keep, how do you keep having hope and courage to keep opening up that door? Well, it's the bright morning star that gives them the hope. It's that name of Jesus that says, even though it's dark, I'm here. And it's not going to be totally dark. In their church, they've got a beautiful fellowship hall. They've got a, a gorgeous church, and they have given that property over, essentially, to refugees. There are 64 people, 16 different families that live in their church now. The fellowship hall, that's their fellowship hall there. Um, their Sunday school rooms, um, they, they, they don't have their Sunday school classes in the rooms anymore because that's sleeping spaces for these families. They just renovated their church, not so they could have better potlucks, but they renovated it so that these families ha have better cooking facilities. Um, the, in, in Kirkuk, the unemployment rate is 90%. And so the church provides these refugees with the stuff that they need, clothes, daily meals, spending money. Um, the church members drive them to doctor's appointments, and they're the ones who pay for any medical bills or tests or medications. The, the church is the lifeline for these families. Almost every day they get calls from people asking for help. And with the help of partners like Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, the Iraqi Partnership Network, the Outreach Foundation, Barnabas Partners, through all of these partners, the Iraqi church has been able to respond to these needs. They've given literally thousands of blankets and heaters to help families through these bitter month, cold months. And trust me, it does get cold in Iraq. So. It doesn't even stop there for the church in Cook. They, they continue the ministry that they were already doing. They do weekly worship. They do prayer gatherings, Bible study. They have an on ongoing radio ministry. Um, they have prison ministries. All that stuff goes on. And the other thing that goes on is their kindergarten ministry. This is a ministry that started in 2006 with 25 students, and now it serves 400 children. 98%, excuse me, I'm sorry, 97% of, of the kids in this kindergarten are Muslim. Why? There, there, there are Muslim schools, but there are many, many Muslim families that do not want to send their kids to these schools because increasingly these schools are starting to teach extremism. And, and Muslim mothers have stood up to their imams and said, I will not have my child or the child that I'm carrying learn a way of hate. And at the, at the Muslim schools, they, or excuse me, at the Christian schools, um, they don't teach Christian doctrine, but, but they, 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 teach, they, they teach the love of God, and they teach the way of Jesus. And Jesus, or Isa, is a respected prophet um, for, for, for the Muslim faith. And so we've heard stories of there, there are Muslim families that have said, sending my child to this school is, is helping he or she become a better Muslim because they're learning the way of the, the prophet Isa. 
Some of these families are, are becoming better Muslims. Some of them are choosing a, a trusting relationship with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Um, some of those Muslims um, remain Muslim, and they continue their, 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 their Muslim practice. Um, a far smaller number of people um, do choose to make a break with, with Islam for, for various reasons. So there's a whole spectrum. But the thing is, is that th this, is, re regardless of how lives are being touched, lives are being touched. And that there is a light that, that, that moderate Muslims are seeing. And, and they, they, they are finding great, great relationship between their Christian brothers and sisters. So, it's the bright morning star that allows them to do this. You know, even though darkness remains, the darkness has been defeated, and there, there is so much light. There, there, there's so, so much to talk about, and I, I think I probably need to stop there. We will have more time after, after the, the service, but it, it, it clearly has touched me seeing, seeing what our partners are doing. It, it, it is amazing. And what I would like us to do now is, is, is to join together in a prayer of solidarity, and it's printed in your, in your bulletin, because we are family. We are bound together through that shared baptism, because in the baptism, we experience that living reality of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in remembering our baptism, we remember God's promises to us and God's gift of forgiveness and, and new life. And we also remember who we are, that we are beloved daughters and sons of God. And finally, we remember that in our baptism, we have received God's own power for living as faithful followers of Jesus in the midst of whatever circumstances surround us. So let's together remember our baptism as we stand with the church in Syria, Lebanon, and Iraq. And I invite you to join me on the bolded portions of this prayer in your worship guide, and I think it will also be on the screen. Let's join together. Sisters and brothers in Christ, Today we gather around the baptismal font.